And, and he would be the first one to say that, that he sees his vision. Zalman sees his vision as, as Chabad refracted through LSD on some level, right? In other words, refracted through the 60s. Before before we get like uh, before I read your yeah. professional bio and CV, I just want to say personally, as someone who's been reading your works and, and deeply enjoying them, just a, a hakar sataiva, a debt of gratitude to you for the tremendous scholarship and the tremendous work you produce. Um, and even more, if I can say this, even more than the actual like depth of scholarship and 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 brilliance of your work, the there was something about your writing which which. Whenever I read it, it always like opened up a whole, a whole cascade of new ideas and new thoughts. And it really right. set my mind off on this chain reaction um, in a way that I haven't experienced experience with many other writers. And that was, that was really a lot of fun reading your work. So thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, you know, the truth is, is that a lot of people who are um, scholars really don't pay enough attention to writing mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as a craft. Mm -hmm. And so I, I try to, so I really appreciate that. That's really cool. <laughs> so we generally like to have, we generally like to begin our conversations here at Seekers with asking our guests to share a bit about their own story, their own journey in their own words. And before I invite you to do that, which I'm eagerly looking forward to, I just want to give a sketch of perhaps what topics we're going to be looking at during the conversation as we discussed in email. So we hope to be able to talk about the intersection between Jewish theology and other theological traditions on the important questions on incarnation and apotheosis. We hope to talk about Jewish mystical antinomianism and the place that that has today in Jewish practice in a, in a pre-Messianic era and the possibilities, opportunities, and dangers of real spirituality today. I'm going to add to this list, although it wasn't in the email that we, that we spoke about, I really would like to get into a discussion of the what's being referred to as the paradigm shift Judaism, the 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 mystical metaphysical vision of Reb Zalman Shachter Shalomi, who I know you are a great scholar of, and I'm a great fan of, and has definitely been someone who inspired my own work here at Seekers of Unity. Um, so I'm going to add that to a list of at least four things that we'd like to talk today, and I know that each of those things we could talk about for days on end, but at least we'll get a taste of them. So Dr. Shalma Gid is a senior research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute. He's the distinguished fellow in Jewish studies at Dartmouth College. His work spans the scope of Jewish thought, specializing in Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, and Hasidut. He has published several books, fantastic books, I can say with firsthand testimony, including From Metaphysics to Medrash, Myth, History, and Interpretation of Scripture, and Lurianic Kabbalah, which won the 2008 American Academy of Religion Best Book Award, Hasidism Incarnate, Hasidism Christianity and the Construction of Modern Judaism, and Hasidism on the Margin, Reconciliation, Antinomianism, and Messianism in the Ishbit Radzin Hasidism. His essays have been published in Moment, Tablet, Tikkun, and Zeek magazines. His latest books are The Bible, The Talmud, and the New Testament, Elio Tzvi Soloveitchik's Commentary on the Gospels, a fascinating character and a fascinating, very unexpected character to writing on the Gospels, and Piety and Rebellion, studies in Hasidism. Shal is also an accomplished claw hammer banjo player. And I think he's also a motorcyclist, if that- if No, that, no motorcycle. No motorcycle. No <laughs> <laughs> I just you know when I got the vibe from you that you're such a cool guy. You probably- the yeah, time I you never, I, my mother, my mother, that's one thing is my mother was, my parents were very, very permissive as, as, a, child, as a child. That was actually the one thing they forbid me to ever do was ride a motorcycle. Do you know what? Same. <laughs> Funnily enough, I, I would love to get a motorcycle all of my childhood and teenagehood. And that's one thing as well that my, my mother would never let me do. And yeah. my, okay, dad, go. my dad for many years was a chaplain with the ambulance. And he was on so many ambulance ride-alongs and just saw how dangerous of a, uh, of a tra mode of transportation that was. And both of them forbade me. So I feel your pain, Charlie, yeah, of being able to ride. Uh, I, I have not. I have not. I mean, I've ridden on a motorcycle, but I don't. <laughs> I actually know how to ride one. Anyway. So, Shal, please, please tell us how you came to be who you are today in your own words. Shal Magid, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and, and, and for the, the project itself. It's a fascinating project. So, I, I mean, I came into, into the world of ideas or spirituality sometime in the mid-1970s. I was graduating from high school and went for a brief time to college. I was an art student 
at the time and decided to drop out of college and to go and live in the mountains in New Mexico. And the reason was, is I, I became involved in this thing called macrobiotics, which, which was very popular in the 1970s, a kind of, kind of theory of diet and spirituality that was connected to a particular person named George Asawa, who was the kind of originator of this. And it, it's this kind of very strict regimen of eating and creating some kind of balance of life. And I, I really was, from the time that I can remember, a person who was looking to live otherwise in some way, to live some kind of alternative lifestyle. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. I mean, it was the, kind of the flesh pots of, of suburbia. It couldn't have been more conventional. And um, I guess it really, you know, I, I, if I look back, I think that there, were two, there, were, there were two books that I read as a child. Well, one as a child and one as an adolescent that I think really in a certain sense started me on the road. The, the first book I read as a child was Chaim Potok's My Name is Asher Lev which it was my first exposure really to anything Jewish. I mean, I come from a Jewish home and a Jewish family, but, you know, I went to Hebrew school, had a bar mitzvah, but I didn't have any sense of what Judaism was until I read that book. And I must've read it when I was probably 11 or so. And it just struck me, Hasidism struck me as some, you know, exotic alternative countercultural lifestyle that somehow I had proximity to simply because I was a Jew. And then a couple of years later, probably when I was 14 or 15, I read Jack Kerouac's On the Road. And that, that pretty much lit the fire in a way. It was like, yes, I'm going to do something completely different. And so I went out to live in New Mexico and was studying acupuncture with a bunch of, of macrobiotics. They're living in a communal house in a small town called Galisteo. And the person I was studying acupuncture with is, was named Bill Rosenberg, who had later, later as now is known as Zev Rosenberg. And he gave me a book that was written by Zalman Shakti Shalomi called Fragments of a Future Scroll, which had just been published probably a few years before. And that book really, in a certain sense, changed, changed my life. When I read that book, I said, okay, I'm gonna you know, get in my VW minibus, drive back to the East Coast, and I'm going to um, work and make money to go to Israel. I just decided from reading Zalman's book that, you know, this is where I was going to go. This was my next thing, which I did. I went to Israel and then I, I, you know, over the course of hitchhiking around the country for a few years, because in those years, in the late seventies, Israel was pretty, was pretty open as a, as a society. You can really hitchhike anywhere and live very cheaply and so on. And I ended up falling in with a bunch of guys who were studying in yeshiva. I had no idea what yeshiva was. I had no idea what, what, you know, what halacha was. I had no idea what Shabbat was, really nothing. And, and I just basically couch surfed with them for a while, started attending yeshiva. And that pretty much was the beginning in a way. I mean, I just, I just fell in a certain sense, fell into it. And then I met a person who became a very important teacher for me named David Din. David was a very close teacher of mine. And, and he really introduced me into a very kind of idiosyncratic, kind of, I would call it monastic Hasidism, where that was really connected to Hasidism as a particular kind of, of spiritual path. And I lived there for a while, studied in yeshiva, ended up moving to Jerusalem, to Israel. And over the course of the next five or six years, living in the Haredi world, I started to feel more and more alienated from the Haredi world. I felt like the questions I was asking weren't the questions that they wanted me to ask. And so I slowly kind of made my way out until I decided at one point, one Arab Shabbat living in Zichron Moshe, which is a neighborhood in the back of Geula, that I was going to go into a barbershop and cut my payas. Yeah. That was like a big thing. Yeah. So I went into this barbershop, Arab Shabbos, and there was this Moroccan, you know, barber. And I just said, yeah, just, he wouldn't do it. He refused to do it. It was like, I'm not taking responsibility for this kind of... Eventually he did. And, and over that, over the course of a, of a couple of years, I started to make my way slowly out of the Haredi world and into a more, more kind of modern world and also kind of drifting to the university. Somehow the university felt like it was a place that I could really continue to explore the things that interested me, but I didn't have to do it within the confines of a community that I felt more and more alienated from. Mm -hmm. So I ended up making my way to the university, making my way to the Shalom Hartman Institute, which was an institute of, of study at that point. And, and, and then, you know, found my way out of the world. But, it, you know, funnily enough, as opposed to a lot of other people who leave the Haredi world after going in, I, I, was, I remained very attached to the, 
the texts. I remained very attached to the ideas. And I eventually ended up coming back to the US to pursue a doctorate in, in, in Jewish studies at Brandeis. And during that time, or a little bit afterwards, I reconnected with Zalman Schachter. When I can reconnected with him again, I, I suddenly felt a real affinity. I, I felt like I really needed to kind of get at what his project was. You know, the interesting thing about that connection is that David Din was once Zalman's secretary in Winnipeg in 1965. Mm -hmm. So it was this strange kind of closing of a circle mm -hmm. for me, anyway, coming in to that world through David and then coming back to uh, coming back to to Reb Zalman. And then, you know, I you know, I I I wrote a doctorate on Ishbet Radzin Hasidism in large part because I became I was introduced to it through Shlomo and Zalman. And I really came to Brandeis to study philosophy. I really didn't come to study Hasidut, but I just kind of slipped into Hasidut just because it was what I knew. And it still, it still pulled me in some way. It still pulled me. I, I couldn't really allow, I couldn't really sever the ties. Mm. So I ended up just putting the energy into writing this, this book on Ishbet Razin, which has this very kind of oblique notion of antinomianism or a tension with, with halakha and spirituality, which I think I've always kind of experienced from the beginning mm. of my, uh, my journey until today. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. What's what's fascinating to me and what's jumping out from your story is your your place is kind of this marginal Jew, to use a term from who is it, John John Mayer, the New Testament scholar, um, yeah. where you're you, you're growing in a in a community which is not exactly in touch with deep Jewish values and spirituality. Yet you find yourself drawn to that, and then you move into that community as an outsider, and you still feel like there's there's something there which is attracting to you, but but not quite who you are. And then you find yourself in the academic world looking for something more, thinking you're into something more academic, but then bringing back your Hasidic, you know, past and, and passion into the academic world. You're kind of, it seems like in whatever position you are, you're, you're kind of not exactly doing what is expected of, of one in that position and kind of trying to, to unite and merge those worlds as you, as you travel through them. Yeah, it's a, it's, I don't know, I don't know if I would call it kind of being radicalized as a youth in some way. That may be a little bit earlier than when I came in, but certainly I was committed to unconventionality. Mm -hmm. And I saw the Haredi world as unconventional. I saw it as a counterculture. But then when I entered into it and I began living in it, I realized, you know something, these people of conformists, just like mm -hmm. the people that I grew up with, except their, their conformity, it just looks different. In other words, yeah, you can find some really interesting unconventional figures in that world, like you can find in any world. But I think my disappointment with the Haredi world was that in a certain sense, it was as normal as any other world. It just had a very different set of values. Now, that's not completely true because I think there's something about the Haredi world that is kind of non, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of anti-materialistic. And that's certainly different the way that, you know, from the secular world that I came from, it places a certain kind of emphasis on spirituality as a value. Mm -hmm. um, but in other ways, you know, Haredim are people just like everybody else. So yeah. I, I guess I felt a little bit disappointed because maybe I came in with, unrealiz with unrealizable expectations. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to then kind of look to be on the margins of something else mm -hmm. or to create another unconventional, you know, uh, find another, another unconventional portal. Now, yep. in some way you could say, well, I mean, academia is the most conventional thing in the world in some level. And I guess that's true. I guess it is. I, yeah, my, sense, I my sense from your writing is that although you're writing from within the academic paradigm and you're writing as a professor and as a chair and as an endowed scholar and very conventional in that sense, there's still a sense where, where you're writing as an academic betrays something of your own internal search and uncomfortableness with the status quo. Um, and perhaps as a, as a objective scholar, one is not supposed to betray those feelings, but my sense is that there's, that there's something in your writing which is really striving for a real sense of, of spirituality, of imminence, of transcendence, of something, of a new vision perhaps in, within, within the systems that we have. I think that's true. And I will say that 
it often happens, not always, it sometimes happens that I'll, I'll write some kind of an essay uh, in Hasidism or Kabbalah or something for an academic journal, and I'll send it to an academic journal. And they send it out to peer review, you know, blind peer review. And sometimes the reader's reports will come back and say exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Like, well, this is not really a kind of standard academic article because it, it seems like actually the writer is really interested or invested or, you know, has a particular agenda or something like that. And um, I think they, they're right you know sometimes they sometimes the you know sometimes the journal accepts the article and sometimes they don't but i think that observation is is uh, it was is accurate good very good and because we have the luxury of not being peer-reviewed here we get to speak freely um and i would really love to through perhaps through the the questions that we opened with to really explore what that what that new vision is and 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 what it means to you and how it can be articulated to a 21st century person yeah, I mean, I think that from I think that that anything that I would say in response to that is in some way derivative of of Zalman Shafter Shalomi's project. I mean, I think I really began in writing po American Post Judaism, which is really kind of an it, it's kind of an ode to him in a lot of ways. Um, it was dedicated to David Din, uh, my teacher, but it really is my particular way of understanding what he what he was doing and what he's about and it, I, you know we had he and i had a really long interesting conversation about the book after i sent it to him and he read it because you know there were parts that he agreed with and parts that he didn't agree with and 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 he he has a different approach that he that he often used to to call to tell me was he his his approach was a of a, of, a, of a pastor he had a pastoral approach his interested his interest was people really mm -hmm. and he wasn't really interested in the metaphysics he wasn't really interested in the theology per se but I, I think I, I I'm not convinced that's actually true since he wrote he wrote plenty of of fascinating theological and metaphysical things I think that it's really based on um, for me. The, the counterintuitive notion that Judaism after the Shoah has to become more expansive rather than more insular. Mm. And it, it, I mean, in, in, certain, in certain way, I consider myself a post-Holocaust thinker. I think we're all post-Holocaust, you know, beings in some way. I mean, we're living in the shadow of that and trying to understand it and trying to kind of recalibrate um, an entire sense of identity and the, a, a tradition in light of that. And, and, and for me, I, and this, this is not original to me, I mean, I think this is, this is the way I understand Zalman, it's that in a sense, Judaism has to become more of a world religion than a religion by Jews for Jews. Mm -hmm. Not that it shouldn't also be that, but that it really actually needs to expand out into the world. Now, in some way, Zalman is getting this from Lubavitcher Rebbe. I mean, it, and, and he would be the first one to say that, that he sees his vision, Zalman sees his vision as, as Chabad refracted through LSD on some <laughs> level, right? In other words, refracted through the 60s. Right. And and, it, you know, he he sees that that the Lubavitcher Rebbe was really had that in mind, but for a variety of reasons was not able to actually go there because of his own context and his own past and his own upbringing as we're all limited by the worlds that we grow up in and we live in. So I think that for me, that the idea of thinking about what it would mean to reconsider Judaism as a world religion that can contribute to the global community as opposed to simply the perpetuation of Jews. Mm. That's that's really that's really fantastic, and I love that line Chabad as as expressed through the prism of LSD, for the sake of the audience here who are both Jewish and Muslim and Christian and Buddhist and Hindu and secular and atheistic and agnostic. Would you care to share a bit about who Reb Zalman was, uh, who he was to you, and how you would perhaps encapsulate the core of his his teaching and his philosophy? Unfortunately, I, I don't think most people know who Reb Zalman was or what he had to. Right. So, so, so he was, um, you know, he, he was born in, um, in Austria, he, uh, of, of, of a fairly traditional family uh, with ties to Hasidism. Um, he, had, he had a strong kind of connection as a, as a child and through school through, um, to, to Hasidism and to Chabad Hasidism. And this is before the First World War. So this is in the 1930s. And he ends up, um, 
he ends up escaping from escaping through a, a DP camp, uh, escaping the war. I think originally to Cuba and then to the United States. And then he had kind of becomes a part of the very, very nascent Lubavitch movement. At that time, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was not the one that's most well known, but actually his father-in-law, the sixth Lubavitch Rebbe as opposed to the seventh. And he becomes very attached to him. And then when in, in 1950, when he dies in 1951, when Lubavitcher Rebbe becomes the Rebbe, it, it's a very... Um, complicated story about the way that he was able to transition from being the disciple of one person to having now to be the disciple of another person. Um, he stays with that movement for a while, and then he begins to kind of drift away in part by studying um, with um, a very important uh, African-American theologian named Howard Thurman at Boston University who actually, uh, you know, interesting that this is Martin Luther King Day tomorrow. So Martin Luther King was in Howard Thurman's seminars in the early 1950s. And Zalman attended Thurman's seminars like the year after King left. So it's, uh, I mean, so it's kind of an interesting kind of little juxtaposition had they been there at the same time, but they weren't exactly the same time. So with, through Thurman, he starts to really expand beyond um, his narrow understanding of Chabad and, and then gets trapped up in the whole kind of 60s counterculture, takes LSD with Timothy Leary, goes through that whole movement. And in a certain sense, he begins to rethink Hasidism and Jewish mysticism as a way to reconstruct Judaism outside of the kind of insular ethnic boundaries in which it, in which it existed. And so, and he calls this this paradigm shift. I mean, this is something that you know we were supposed to talk about. We can just bring it up now. He uses this language, paradigm shift, which he gets from Thomas Kuhn, who has a whole other theory of paradigm shift in terms of the notion of science. Um, but the way that Zalman understands it is that they, they are kind of these epical periods in Jewish history, and. Um, he's not the first one to do that. There are Kabbalistic texts that make the same kinds of claims using different language. And that in a sense, you can have this kind of leap out from one period to another period. And he, he saw the Shoah as the end of an epoch, an end of a Jewish epoch and the beginning of another one. Now, this is really very much drawn from the age of Aquarius, new age religion that's happening at the same time. So he's totally kind of in a certain sense, adapting it to that. And that, you know, for me, my own kind of journey, so to speak, really happens in the early 70s when New Age religion was really coming into its own. And people were starting to think about um, these kinds of global humanistic uh, spiritual, uh, spiritualities that are drawing from the East and drawing from the West and drawing from Native American religions. And it was all really about syncretism and it was about breaking down the boundaries between one group and another group. So in a certain sense, I grew up in that in high school and he was kind of a part of that probably a decade before. So it was a very easy fit for me because I was always, I was already somewhat um, primed to see Judaism as something outside of the thing that, you know, the things that Jews do or the things that Jews have to do. Now, I, I should say, I mean, I was, you know, I lived in Maya Sharm. I was very part of much, a very, very deeply a part of that world. And I deeply believed in it. So I'm in here and I'm sense I'm engaging with a, you know, an argument inside of myself between those two things, because David Din was a true believer in the ability to plumb the depths of a tradition only by a curtain, certain kind of severe ascetic devotional practice even though he was also a universalist in his own way, hmm. um, particularly in his relationship to Christianity. Hmm. Uh, so in a way, it, 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 it fit my own temperament and my own inclinations. And it, I, I've tried to translate some of that into an academic register to, to, to be able to present to a, to a different kind of audience. Um, the viewpoint of um, Judaism as expansive as opposed to being uh, insular. Hmm. And I, I take it that this is something that you yourself 
believe in as as desirable and not just as a as an academic is studying it from the outside yes i mean you know I, if you asked me that 10 or 15 years ago i would probably be a lot more reluctant but i think at you know now that i'm over 60 i you might as well kind of come out of the closet yes in some way i mean i do i do it, this is something that i i advocate and i feel like I feel like if I could make a small contribution to that project, that would that would be you know worth all of the kind of academic articles and academic books that I've written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. The the desire to move beyond just ideas and to actually have some sort of impact on the way that things are actually practiced and, and understood is definitely an interesting idea and something which we try and do here. We try to bring you know academic thought away from or out of the journals and to the, to the people, to the public. You write very beautifully yeah. in, your, in your book regarding Reb Zam's response to the realization of global consciousness, as you put it, that, if you don't mind me quoting you, that to understand Sheikh the Shalami, one must read the Baal Shem Tov, Schneerson, Max Weber, William James, Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, and Ram Dass, all in a heated conversation with one another, which I think is such a beautiful idea because it, it both plays with the classic perennialist modern idea where we're taking wisdom from all traditions, but it inserts that very stereotypical Jewish idea that there's not just a, a harmony of voices, but there's actually a heated conversation and debate amongst those voices. This, this is a very interesting, th very interesting theme, which I see throughout your writing, where the, the ability to, and I'm sure there's something which you've had to respond to a lot of critique about, the ability to argue for a universal global paradigm shifting Judaism in the face of what people may see as some sort of naive um, universalism or an erasure of differences or a, a melting pot where, where, where any particularity is, is done away with. How, how, do, how does one live a, a religious life, whether they be Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, whatever it is, in a way that's deeply true to their own tradition and yet deeply true to the collective reality that we're all here on planet earth together, you know, a collective divine being. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I think that is, that is the operative question that I think certainly um, uh, Judaism struggles with perhaps in a way that's distinctive from some of the other religions, which aren't as kind of ethnically rooted or ethnically based. Uh, I, I just don't want to say that 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 line about about Rav Zalman. I mean, lately I've been going through some of the more recently published stuff by Hillel Zeitlin, and Hillel, in Hillel Zeitlin's work, you see the same actual thing. You see, except it's, you see that it's you know the Baal Shem Tov, Nachman of Bratzlav, William James, Rasputin, Leif Shestov, right? Jung. I mean, he's really in a certain sense. Uh, Freud, in a certain way, he 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 maybe maybe is really one of the earlier people mm -hmm. from that period who simply was not willing to limit his exploration of spiritual traditions, even though he remained kind of deeply committed to the one that, that he was born into. So I think in a certain sense, Zalman is just another, Zalman is in a certain way like Hillel Zeitlin 2.0 mm -hmm. or Hillel Zeitlin post Shoah. Mm -hmm. I mean, tragically Zeitlin was killed in the Holocaust. So, um, I just want to kind of make that point. I, I, I mean, that, that in a certain sense, the particular universal question which exercises everyone from Franz Rosenzweig to Martin Buber to Manuel Levinas, I mean, all of these things, every, everyone is trying to kind of make sense of that. Mm -hmm. And I think all of, and all of the ways in which they make sense of that are productive. They don't actually resolve the tension because the tension itself has to exist. It's embedded. Mm -hmm. It's baked into the very thing. It goes back to the Hebrew Bible, really, mm -hmm. in terms of the relationship between the, the self and the community and the ethnos and the world. I just think that at each particular moment in, in history, people have different opportunities to make sense of that in a different way. I mean, we're living in a time where we have the opportunity not only to explore, but we have the we're given the opportunity as Jews to have a voice mm. in a way that Jews weren't 75 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it just didn't exist. I mean, because of the way in which society, society was constructed. So instead of basically using that opportunity to say, oh, the opportunity exists for assimilation. So therefore we have to reverse 
coarse and we have to become more insular in order to be able to avoid assimilation. It's like, actually, how do you, how can you open yourself up to assimilation while remaining kind of deeply rooted in a particular tradition? So mm-hmm. it, how could you be spiritually assimilated and physically distinct? Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is on there, Rav Cook, Rav Cook has this great line that I'm trying to think of what it is in the Hebrew and I'll translate it. He says, um, Something like tzimtzum ha-maaseh v'harchava l'machshava. Something that's like a kind of contracted sense of, 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 of being, but an expansive sense of thinking. Mm. Something like that. Very interesting. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm exactly right, but it's close. Yeah, it's a, that's a fascinating notion. It's a, it's a, and, and I mean, that struggle really is, is, the, is the ongoing question. And, and you're right in saying that that tension really has to be maintained and not necessarily resolved. What I'm, what I'm finding as I'm studying the world's mystical traditions is that what really unites them is their deep metaphysical convictions where, where one would perhaps believe that the similarities are external. The, as you know, the more one gets into the, into the essence of the tradition, if we can use such a term, the more one sees a, a commonality in the core. And I think that's something which Reb Zalman was definitely and, and Hillel Zaitlin and, and all the you know, modern perennialists have really been pointing to. And I'm curious to know if you could highlight for us what you feel are the core metaphysics of, of Jewish thought as expressed through that, through that paradigm and how they would relate then to, to the rest of the world's mystical traditions in a way that does lead to a, a unitive, connected place. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I think that there, there, was a, there was a movement earlier on. I think it kind of starts with William James, but it kind of goes much further that where there was a lot of talk about this kind of unified, this unified sense of, of spirituality. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I really kind of buy into that. However, I just do think that that people who are, I don't know whether they're term mystically inclined or inclined toward the idea that, um, the, the, the idea of otherness are, are, are just asking similar questions. Mm-hmm. And it's really the, what what unifies what unifies these various traditions are really the questions that they're asking, mm-hmm. not necessarily the answers that they give. So the and, and and it doesn't really matter that the answers are different if the questions are the same mm-hmm. or the questions are similar. And so for me, I've always understood the Kabbalistic tradition or Hasidic tradition really as not you know you think about oh these Kabbalists or these Hasidim they're kind of ultra orthodox. I understand. I understand the mystical tradition of Judaism as incredibly subversive of mm. Jewish normativity. Mm. It's it's it, and that I you mean that's in a certain sense what the what drew me to write that book Hasidism Incarnate about Judaism and Christianity. That in in a sense these Kabbalists, what however they practiced and whatever they did in their daily lives, what they put on paper that we read is incredibly subversive of the very lives that they led in some way. Now. Why that is, I have no idea. But I, 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 I've always sensed a certain kind of resistance to the very norms and practices of the tradition that exists within those texts. And, and obviously, the reason that the reason that there was so much antipathy and the reason that was there was so much resistance to Kabbalah is precisely because those people sense that resistance. And, and so when you have something like the Sabbatean heresy in the 17th century, which was the heresy of this false Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, who basically comes and claims that he's Messiah, but more than claiming he's the Messiah, also then converts to Islam. And then his disciples claiming that that's part of the messianic vocation is converting to Islam. There, you know, Gershom Shalom, the great scholar of Kabbalah would say, oh, actually, Sabbat, Sabbatean heresy, which is the inversion of tradition, is not the uh, is not really abnormal. It's simply one logical consequence of the whole Kabbalistic tradition. Mm. There's something within the Kabbalistic tradition that lends itself to the subversion of the entire tradition itself. Mm. And I think that what what I like about that tradition is living in that tension of the norm and the subversive of the norm that are happening simultaneously. And the kind of creative energy that really emerges out of that. Mm. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure how far I can push you uh, as an academic, but yeah. um, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try my luck here. You speak a lot about the the idea of of apotheosis and incarnational theology in Jewish thought, um, and you trace its development from the Bible, from Moses through to the figures of Rashbi and Moshe de Leon and the Ramak and the Ari and the Marinayim and the Ishbitzer and Chabad and Reb Zaman. It really the full gambit. The idea that the human come in, can, can in some sense realize their full humanity in becoming divine, if I can if I can phrase it that way. Yeah. Right. And 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 it definitely is a subversive idea, and it's an idea which perhaps puts Judaism more in line with with our neighboring theologies than Jews themselves may be comfortable with that don't know their own you know history theology well. But it's a subversion which which I get from your books is actually returning to some form of Judaism, which was which always was there. It's not it's not it's not a subversion which is against Judaism. It's a subversion back into into Judaism or into at least a Judaism. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering beyond the theological and historical and scholarly, you know, jargon and and text and proof texting. I'm wondering what does this idea potentially mean for for someone living today in, in today's 21st century post Holocaust post modern world. Is there, is there a sense that, that this theological, very antiquated and very poetic theological notion has meaning for, for an average human today? That's a, that's a good question. I, you know, I think the average human may not be necessarily a seeker in the sense that, that not everybody is dissatisfied with, with, with the very kind of nature of their own existence such that they're, they're going to really be seeking something else, something beyond. I mean, I, th- I, I think that one of, the, one of the things that I wanted to get across with that idea is, first of all, the very notion of the deification of the human being or incarnation or apotheosis or theosis or whatever it is, either God becoming the human or the human becoming God, which really stands at the very center of Christianity, obviously, is simply not a an idea that's anti, that's that that's antithetical to Judaism per se. I mean, it's a path that Judaism thus has not far has not taken, and maybe in part because other people within Judaism took it and then took it outside of Judaism. But the very idea of the the aspirational idea of divination. Is, is something I think is really embedded entirely in the scriptural tradition. Mm-hmm. And therefore to see Christianity as somehow categorically other than Judaism, I've just never felt comfortable with. I've, I, I've always felt like it is a particular iteration of Judaism that 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 you know it, that that took a certain path and went in a certain way, it, you know. So it may be deviant in a sense, but it's not categorically different. And and this really kind of brought me to that book, to the book I wrote on Eliyahu Tzvi Soloveitchik, who's this 19th century Lithuanian rabbi from the kind of from literally from the belly of Lithuanian Judaism, who just decides that no, there's no difference between Judaism and Christianity, and then he writes this Hebrew commentary to the New Testament to try to prove that. Mm-hmm. Now, whatever whatever one may think of 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 what he did and what the book is and what his interpretations are. I think that the, I felt a kindred spirit when I discovered him. I felt like, oh yeah, I you know I think the same thing. Um, he was able to garner the, his entire Talmudic training in, in order to be able to make this the, the argument that he made. But I still I still think that that for and, and this goes to your question that that there is a kind of belief in, I don't know if I would call it Jewish exceptionalism, but Jewish otherness, that somehow all of these other things, whether it's Christianity or Islam, just within the scriptural traditions, they are antithetical to Judaism. Not only are they other than Judaism, but they're antithetical to Judaism. And I I think the idea of what it would mean for the human being to aspire to become a divine being in some way, or even the divine becoming human is not, is not, an, it, it does not kind of like rub against the grain of the tradition as I see it. 
Mm. And I think that you see that in the, you see that among the Kabbalists who are able to play with that idea of what is the tzaddik exactly? What is the son? Of, what is this notion of you know bnei Elohim or the sons of God? That ter- what did that terminology mean in the prophets? Mm. What 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 can I, I think? I think one of the things that the, one of the ways that it could be useful is to say, look, on some level, on some level, we're all on the same path, right? I'm, by all, I mean all people who are seeking something like this, that we're all basically asking the same questions. And we have a lot to learn from the ways in which our various traditions have chosen to answer them. This is not to say, oh, let's be just comparative religionists, right? Or that all religions are the same. It's not, it's not saying that. It's saying that we're all basically working in the same direction. And Judaism has garnered incredible amount of wisdom over the course of its history in order to grapple with these questions. But these other traditions have done the same thing. And in some way, I think that I've gotten a lot from Reb Zalman to, to say that it's not about comparison. It's about being open to a certain kind of syncretism. Yes, we can learn from these practices. We can learn from these ideas. Not just to say that two religions will sit down in some kind of ecumenical Congress and say, okay, let's talk about the things that you know we, we share. No, let's talk about the things that we don't share too. And let's be able to kind of grapple with the, 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 the plethora of, of, of ideas that we carry with us through the traditions that we have in order to be able to, you know, continue the journey. Yeah. So I, I think the case that, that you made so eloquently now and so abundantly eloquently in your books is a very, is a very important one. And, and seeing the, the source of these ideas in, in the depths of Jewish scripture and then being able to see those in, in other tradition scriptures as well. But I want, to take, I want to take a step further than what I've seen in your books itself. And this is part of the privilege of being able to sit down and, and speak to you. I'm yeah. curious to know if you think that this, this human and religious desire to in, in the move into the divine or to blur the category of the human and the divine is embedded not just in authentically in Jewish scripture, as the case you made now, but is embedded somehow in the human experience itself, in or or in the in the reality of existence somehow. And this is moving yes. this is moving away from a question of textuality to a question of of perhaps experientiality or, or, or reality, if if I can take it there. Yeah, because in some way, you know, in, in some way, we human beings create this idea of God, um, a, or one God, or many gods, or whatever, uh, and and then we then we want to imitate that, our own creation. So in a certain sense, we're, we're, it's like this reification, right? We're taking an idea about what we want to be, and we're making it something out there, and then we try to become it. So the, in a certain sense, there is that that kind of the natural way in which human beings. Uh, project their own fantasies, at, sometimes negative, sometimes positive fantasies that they then try, that they then try to to live. I mean, I feel the same way when 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 thinking about and talking about the idea of what does it mean that God is one? I mean, what does that what does the whole notion of oneness mean? I mean, are the Kabbalists really questioning that? I mean, what is this whole like divine godhead and plethora of gods and the ten spherot and all the different kinds of things? I mean, why why break it up in that way? In a certain sense, the idea of of godliness is basically the way the way I understand it best is, which is why I'm I'm not really such an advocate of this kind of radical transcendent oneness, because I don't really think it, it does it. I'm not sure what work it does. I think it's, it's, um, it's what, what speaks to me more is that God is kind of the infinite regress of details, hmm. right? Which you see in, let's say the Lurianic tradition hmm. that doesn't speak about the one God. It speaks about the fact that the details of godliness are infinite. So the infinitude is not the oneness, the infinitude is the infinite regress. Hmm. And, and that, that, that allows me to also experience the world as something divine. Sure. 
yeah and that that vision of, of a deified world is is definitely something which is central to, to Jewish mysticism no doubt I'm, I'm curious though that the that the the, the experiential drive towards theosis or apotheosis or incarnation would would be attributed just to the human's creation of God in their image and therefore the creation of 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 vice versa of the human in the, in the, in the image yeah. of God which is how you the quote which you opened from Elliot Wilson in your right. incarnate right. but I'm, I I would if I if I had to guess I would I would venture and I'm curious to know what you think about this that the drive for the human to to feel the the presence of the divine in in the self and and the unity or the regression of detail involved in that stems rather from from the mystical experience which is part of the range of experience that we humans have yes yeah and and i i i mean i think that i think that's true and i think for my own personal life it's really you know the way to this you know, project really comes through reading Aldous Huxley, Doors of Perception, reading William James. I mean, those people who were trying to articulate the way in which experience is the origin point of thought. And that in a sense, we reflect out of that experience into into worlds and then and then in some cases, I mean, depending upon, you know, the, the person's talent and expertise, right, develop like a whole, you know, metaphysical worldview that really emerges, as James would say, right, in that experience. There's something about the ex that individual's experience of the world, either their own sense of self or their relationship to that which they experience, which then creates the kind of a kind of a tabula rasa, like an empty space that you just fill with all of the ways in which you want to articulate that. And that articulating that in some way, which is kind of what Kabbalah does, articulating that is itself the process of becoming it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Hasidism in a certain sense, I think Hasidism in a way, we think about Hasidism as an extension of Kabbalah. It's some way it's a kind of a reversal. Mm -hmm. Right, because Hasidism is trying to say, okay, what would it be to come just back to the experience? Mm. Right. What if we just like swept away all of the metaphysical musings and just came back to this notion of of, of experience, either through meditation or either through silence or either through you know ex walking in the woods, whatever whatever it is that Hasidism is really in some way the inversion of Kabbalah in that it's trying to get back to that origin point or some of Hasidism. Right, anyway. right. So as as a scholar of Jewish mysticism, would you would you agree with that Jamesian Huxleyan Huxleyan interpretation of of mysticism how it derives from the experience, which is then extrapolated into its metaphysics and whatnot? You know, that's a really good question. I think I, I think as, a, as an adolescent and then as a young person, I was, it, it, it spoke to me. Um, it's very strongly. I think that when I go back and reread that stuff now, I find it a little bit, I, I don't know what the word would be, a little, a little, Le less inspirational than it did then, but, but maybe that's okay. Maybe it did its work. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I absorbed it. And, and then when, when I moved on and went wherever I went, when I look back, I say, well, oh, that's kind of like, that's simplistic or that's kind of naive or, or whatever. But, but I, I think, no, I, th I think particularly with James, no, I think that James is, is really for me, someone who, is is inside inside me in the sense that when I when I read varieties of religious experience and I've later had to teach it and sometimes when you teach it it's how it really kind of undoes itself because mm -hmm. then you have to kind of stand back and be the mm -hmm. critic but but when I'm reading it not as a critic when I'm reading it just as a as a you know as an aspiring adept of sorts I think it speaks to I would say it this way. I can't say whether it's true in any kind of objective sense. I think subjectively in terms of my own experience, it does give voice to the experience that I had, which pulled me in this direction. Mm. Yeah, that's a very fair uh, way of stating it. I'm, I'm actually curious to know because, because I, I do find um, the Jamesian Huxleyan interpretation in that regard to be quite compelling and inspiring. And I, perhaps I'm still in a, in a younger stage and I'm, I'm where you once were. Well, 
Your beard is still black. Mine is white. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll let you know where I get this bid. Die. It's really it's quality stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, cu- I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious to know two things. I'm curious to know firstly what is it because because I, I am interested in being critical here and in being and being methodological and philosophical about these things and not being just carried away by by enthusiasm. You know, I, I was I was brought up and still belong to the Chabad community, and in Chabad we very much cherish being rational and being being logical and being consistent about our things not just being caught up in in his spilus and in, in feeling as emotion yeah. um which is which may be part of chabad's you know superiority complex but we'll, we'll leave that for for a therapy session um but yeah. um, i'm curious to know i'm curious to know a what what you find today um being a, a scholar and a professor to be to be simplistic or naive about those positions and and perhaps what would be a better when, when I read the mystical, when I read the literature of the mystical traditions, their their theologies, their mythologies, their poetries, this explanation seems to be seems to be very compelling as to why they have such similar questions and formulations and 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 aspirations. Um, so I'm curious to know both what you find simplistic about it and, and what perhaps may better explain the deep commonality, which I think there is across the literature of the world's mystical traditions. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in, in some way, as you were talking, I, w- I, I was thinking of Roca and a number of different poets of that genre who I think in some way capture a lot of the experiential component of, particularly with Roca, the experiential component of, of being in the world that, that easily translates into these kinds of of traditions. But I I, I wanna go back to, you know, in a certain sense, when I kind of hang out in the more, let's say Jewish renewal circles, which which I love doing, and there are people there that I really love and cherish, I feel very close to, but I feel sometimes for for my own taste that there's a certain almost commitment to the experiential at the expense of, the rational or intellectual, which I find uh, somewhat limiting mm. um, or dissatisfied. I feel dissatisfied. Like I can't really totally buy into it. I mean, the beauty of that experiential expression, whether it's in art or whether it's in music or whether it's in, uh, in, in, in teaching is there, but there's something that, there's something that, that I feel it, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but something that I feel it doesn't go deep enough because it lacks the kind of intellectual and contemplative component. Mm-hmm. And yet when I'm in where I, when I'm in, you know, when I'm in the academy, I feel just the opposite. I feel like all of that rigor and all of that the intellectual energy is in, in full gear, um, or, or in high gear, I should say. And it's, you know. It's, it's working at the highest possible level, but it misses, there's something that the, the experiential component is too, seems too dangerous hmm. because it would demand a certain kind of compromise of, of, of intellectual rigor. Hmm. I mean, you see this breakdown in certain philosophical thinkers, I think, like Martin Heidegger, as an example, who it was able to try to puncture the hyper-rationalism of, uh, of the kind of Kantian world that he kind of inherited mm-hmm. and to create some kind of other, you know, philosophy of being or Buber's kind of dialogical thinking. In other words, there are philosophers that are trying to actually bring those together. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that the, the, academic, the academic enterprise is committed to shelving the experiential and the personal to some degree, because it would compromise the intellectual rigor that's required to do the work that it wants to do. Mm. And, and I think in some way, I understand that. I think there's something to that, that that intellectual work does require a certain amount of, of, intensi- of, of intellectual intensity mm. that would be compromised in some way by the emotive. Mm. But I, I mean, for me, um, I, I guess, um, you know, as, as many people are trying to kind of combine those things and, mm. and, and, and create something from a combination of, of both 
the personal, the subjective, yeah. as well as the as the intellectual. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very interesting point, and I wonder if if the experiential is necessarily conflated with the emotional. I mean, because the experiential for the same price could be the empirical, which is which is far from from, from the you know emotive. The way there's there's a very great definition of mysticism I came across from Peter Moore, I think it was, who says mysticism is comprises of experience, theory, and practice. And I see in the great mystics of, of all traditions a, a capacity to unify their 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 empirical experiences of reality, which is subjective, granted, with with really incredible, rigorous intellectual philosophical thinking. I mean, names like Meister Eckhart and Ibn Arabi and Shankara and Garjana and and their Russia, like mm-hmm. just room, yeah, great people, people that have, yeah. that have pr- pr- profound experiences and are not sloppy in their philosophy as a consequence, but find a way to, to unite that and to channel that into, into their practice, into their ethical practice. And this is something actually that, that, that I have here, you wrote yourself in between paradigm shift Judaism and new Hasidism, that, that beyond just the call for a Jewish social gospel, that there's also a need to present a new metaphysics, that one that conforms to a theory of multiplicity surrounded by divine unity, which is a beautiful expression, thank you. When, when this new metaphysics is in place, a new practice can emerge that confirms to the paradigms and the parameters of a new theological system, that there's a need actually to, to, to take that experience and push it through and process it into a metaphysic, which can then lead us to an ethic and to practice to, to the betterment of society. So, so I'm curious to know if, if necessarily incorporating the mystical experience into one's study and exploration of mystical theory is, is necessarily detrimental or perhaps can be seen as more of a holistic uh, perspective to bring to a unification of theory, experience, and practice. I think, yeah, I, I, even, even more than that, I, w- I would say that the great thinkers of, of the world in all civilizations are those people who were able to do precisely that. I mean, in a certain sense, it makes, um, you know, it, it's the difference between a kind of a good philosopher and a great thinker, mm. who are the, a person that was a, would, would be able to do that. And, and I say that not only people like Rumi and Meister Eckhart and the Baal Shem Tov and, and, and you know, uh, and people like that. Um, I would also say someone even like Freud, you know, who was able to go deeply into the human condition and try to understand it in, in a in a particular kind of way. And I think I think it's it's the good thinkers and the good uh, you know creative beings are people that are a, that live in one of those two. I mean, obviously, it's always kind of mixed, but I think it's the great ones who are able to actually bring those bring those out. I think the Hebrew prophets is another example. I mean, um, and it, it's really, it, it, it's, it's, I think the difference between good literature and great literature mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. I think it's precisely that, that, that admixture between subjectivity and emotions and reason and the intellect that when it's, when, when, when that mixture hits a particular chord, it explodes. Mm-hmm. And you can see that in, someone like Rilke, and you can see that in someone like Picasso. Mm. I mean, it's not only within, you know, in, the, in letters, it's also in visual art. Uh, so that's, that's the key. But, you know, most of us don't merit that kind of, that, you know, it's really a schut. I mean, it really is, it really is a gift, mm. right? I mean, in a certain way, the idea of schut, which is kind of merit in, you know, Hebrew, I, I think that schut really best translates as gift. Mm. It's a gift. People have that gift. And if you have that gift and you put it to use, um, I think Nietzsche is another person. Mm. I mean, it's just, you know, sometimes you can read somebody and you just feel like it just, it's exploding off the page, right? It's just like, like, like things are happening mm. because I think that things were happening in them as they were writing it. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm very um, curious and, and, and motivated by that thought and trying to chase perhaps that uh, that schut, that that really has the transformative power to to bring us to a new vision of reality because because it's very clear that the world the way it's currently operating um, is really just not sustainable. I mean the, the the current paradigms 
are, are creating situations that, you know, economic and global and environmental that, that really need to be revisited. And, and my, my perhaps naive hope and aspiration is that there's something in the mystical traditions that can inform a new narrative for humanity when, when those three come together and unite. And, and I'm curious to know what perhaps might be the unique Jewish perspective or, or Jewish um, gift to the world in, in, a, in a, to, to a day and age where, where a new story is needed. What might be, what might be the, the unique contribution that would, that would allow the, the, the giants of Jewish spirit to be placed alongside the Rilkas and Picassos and Rumis? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think um, uh, I, I've had people close to me um, who have said, you know, why, why don't you just like, just like, you know, shave your beard, just like give, what, give up the Jewish thing, just like, you know, go, go out in the world and, you know, say what you want to say, you know, why are you hiding behind the Jewish thing? And it, it, it's actually, you know, I, I take it seriously. I mean, I think that um, we're only on this planet for a limited period of time. And I think that for whatever reason, I've kind of thrown my lot in with the Jews. I don't, I don't know exactly why that's happened, I, but I think it's happened. And I, I, don't, I don't really feel that it, it's so much of who I am. It's so much a part of who I am that I don't think I can really be who I am without it anymore. Yeah. Uh, whether that's a good thing or it's a bad thing, I don't know. But your question is really, in a sense, the, the question, what do we have to offer the world? And I think that that is the question that I, um, that, that exercises me and that kind of pushes me forward. I mean, there's a lot of things, obviously, we can talk about all kinds of things. We can talk about the Hebrew prophets. We can talk about, you know, uh, you know, people say, oh, it's monotheism, but I don't know, monotheism, I don't even know what that means really. And why is that the best thing? I'm not, why is it better than something else? I don't really know. Um, you know, people killed each other for monotheism and they killed each other without monotheism. So yeah. I don't, I'm not sure how monotheism has resolved that problem. I think that um, that from the from from the, the from the position as a Jew, I think that the ability to absorb and adapt and change and evolve by making sure that the boundaries between us and the other is always per, are always permeable, mm-hmm. whether wittingly or unwittingly, and that. That, that that kind of evolution really has the potential to produce something good as opposed to something as opposed to something bad. Now the danger of that is when those barriers disappear, then the Jew easily disappears into the you know the, the great sea of humanity. And yes, that is the uh, that is the actual operation. That is the occupational hazard. And so people will say, oh, well, let's just like, let's create a nation state or let's, you know, go inward or let's, I understand the, the impulse, the, the fear, but I think that's precisely the, the, I think that's precisely the challenge. Mm. I think the challenge is to be able to actually um, be a universalist without erasing one's distinctive na- notion of self. Mm. And it's it's what pushes me forward, and the reason why I feel like I can't write about Judaism without also writing about and thinking about Christianity and Islam. Like I don't think you can think about Judaism in isolation. I don't think Judaism was meant to be thought in isolation. I don't think it ever was in isolation. I mean, there's a there's some mythos that it was, but I don't really think that it, it that it that it ever was, nor should it be. And I think that, in a way, my view about where the Jewish world is going now, I mean, the Jewish world, whatever that means, is 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 in the opposite direction. Hmm. And it's trying to create difference, and it's trying to create opacity, and it's saying it's trying to create, and it's doing it in all kinds of ways. It's doing it religiously, it's doing it politically, it's doing it in all kinds of ways, and 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 I'm you know I'm fighting against that tide, mm, yeah. and that's basically uh, you know the rest of the time I'm on this earth. That's probably what I'll do. It sounds like you're you're trying to live inside that paradox. 
Yeah, yeah, and and and, and it it is an it is an unresolvable paradox, mm-hmm. you know. And and I can understand saying, you know what, I'm just tired of this. I just want to like live out here. I live on 14 acres of land in the woods. I could just play my banjo and and <laughs> it just like just like relax. But it you know it it this it seems like this 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 drive inside me i can recognize from the time i was 14 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i i I think it's like it's 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 a um it's it's uh what we what i call it it's um uh some kind of uh i one would call it even a disability like i can't disabuse myself of it (laughs) that's an interesting way of putting it I want to I want to move on to the to the last topic which we set out to to talk about and I think I've taken about an hour of your time which is generally how much time I take from people uh, before making okay. a request to take more of their time. Um, <laughs> so I actually want to I want to read a quote from your book Chassism Incarnate, which kind of I think will bridge the last part of the conversation to the coming and to the to the final. You quote Altman, Alexander Altman, who's quoting Leo Beck who's writing that the Jew has the particular gift, the special genius for embracing the mystery and the commandments in one single glance to experience the metaphysical as an imperative, as commanding mystery. I'm curious to know, just to, to get your thought on that quote before I take it to where I want to go. Right. I, I mean, the only, thing I, I, the only thing I don't like about that quote is, is something that's very particular to Leo Beck and to, to a certain extent, Alexander Altman, you know, people of their time. I don't necessarily think that the Jew has any particular gift more than anybody else for that. Um, so I think that I'm a, a 21st century version of, of, of Beck's 19th century thinking about, about the Jew. Uh, but yes, I mean, I think that, I think that people, some people, people for whom that matters have that potential um, to be able to, um, to be able to do that, to be able to capture that. Do you, do you believe that there is a possibility to experience the metaphysical as, as an ethical imperative, as a commanding mystery? Yeah, I do. Okay. So I want to, I want to take this to the last section of the conversation, which is about antinomianism. Uh, for the listener, antinomianism means the, um, the abrogation of nomos, of laws, of living outside the boundaries of conventional and societal strictures and laws and conditions in Judaism. That would be living beyond the boundaries of halakha, but that could be applied to, to any culture and tradition. And you write quite um, extensively and beautifully about the place that antinomianism has in Jewish thinking. And what particularly caught my attention is your description of the, the clash that exists in the, in the proto-Messianic world, which, I, which is a phrase of yours, which I just absolutely love, where the exilic and redemptive eras crash. The redemptive era represents a, a place of love and compassion and unity, and the exilic represents a place where, you know, unfortunately there's strife and competition and jealousy and otherness. And, and there's kind of this individual, this, this character who is, who's tortured, the messianic archetype, who has the drive for to go beyond and yet is caught in the world that, that is still within those strictures. And I think this question applies really to people that live beyond just, you know, versions of, of religious law, be it Sharia or Halakha or whatever, whatever that is, because we live in, we live in a society which has certain operative norms based on the current operating conditions that we live in. And it's almost like there's, there's an upgrade to the system, which might be coming, which isn't coming quite yet, where that may change. And people feel like they'd like to be in that world, but can't be. And it creates a real, a real tension and a real, and something which, which, which I can definitely resonate with, where there's a desire to, to be living in the next while still stuck in the now, although the, although the next may be the real now. And, yeah. and I'm curious, I'm curious to know, I'm curious to know what that tension means to you and what that tension means, not just to a, to a 18th century, you know, Hasidic master in Poland, but what that means really to, to our listeners here today, what it means to, to be in that space and perhaps what wisdom the Jewish mystical tradition has to someone that's caught in that tension. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, I think it's a very, um, that's a great question, by the way. I think it's, it's, it's a very um, beautiful place and it's a very dangerous place. Um, and and part of its beauty is precisely in its liminality mm-hmm. that it's you feel like like uh, something is happening right the line from Dylan right something is happening but you don't know what it is there's something happening 
and it's calling you to be a part of it. And it's demanding of you to behave in a way that seems to be counter to the way in which the world has taught you to behave. So in a certain sense, it's, it is, it's not, it's not like, and this is the paradigm shift. I think to, to, in a certain sense, that was, I'm going to say it's, you know, we talk about revolutionary times and when we usually talk about revolutionary times. We're talking about the way that human beings begin to kind of undermine the kind of status quo and the norms, but there's a sense in, there's a sense in which the, the, the time itself is revolutionary. Mm. That it's not human beings that are necessarily initiating it, that you, but rather human beings are responding to it. And, and I do think that post Shoah, that post Holocaust is that time, mm. is one of those times. I don't think it's the time. I mean, everyone wants to think they're living in the messianic era, but, uh, and, men, and men in many, you know, many generations thought they were living in the messianic era, and each one of them was 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 mistaken. I mean, I think all messiahs are false. So I, I don't really believe in, I, I think that I think that the only messiah that's true is the one that has not yet come. And as soon as that, that one comes, then it's false. So it's a, it, 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 for me, it's, it's really about, that doesn't mean that, that, that doesn't mean that things are, are not changing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we can resist that change. And we all interpret what that change is, of course. It's no, it's no some ob objective thing. We can resist it. We can go with it. Or we can, or we can, and if we go with it, we can try to figure out, well, what role do we play? How can I be a participant in that change? So I, 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 I do think that and maybe that's naive and and um even living at the end of the trump administration and watching what happened on january 6th at the capitol I mean uh and also be and also living through 1967 and 1968 in america which also felt like something was really changing and something was really happening and people will talk about well the you know the the left failed in the late 60s i don't think that's actually true i think something actually was happening mm. i think something did happen I think there was the kind of birth of a new level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now that gets spun out in all kinds of different ways, some ugly ways, some beautiful ways. But I, I do think that what we were experiencing then is not dissimilar to what we're experiencing now. It's another iteration of a kind of a shifting, a shifting paradigm. And as somebody who lives inside the Jewish tradition, how should Jews or Judaism, not Jews, Jews can do whatever they want, but how should Judaism respond to that, right? What, what is the, what way, this goes back to your earlier question. So I think that the antinomianism is in a certain sense, for me, a description of that, of that space. Hmm. It's, we're living in some kind of antinomian space. And the antinomian space is not around deviance from the law. The antinomian space is about resistance to the norm mm. at the same time that one is also cognizant of going too far and what the occupational hazards of going too far might be mm. and being able to try to figure out a way to 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 do that to contribute to move things forward mm. i mean I, I i really do think that the antinomian antinomianism is a necessary component for any gnomic tradition, that mm. any system has to always be able to produce its own resistance mm. in order to be, in order to stay vibrant and to keep alive. Mm. Just to perhaps dare to, to end by bringing things from that high note of optimism into a note of practicality, how might you see our current antinomian time manifesting um, and, and what might be the, the general directions that, that people looking back on life and, and looking back with your, with your learning and experience and, and, and what, what might be the directions that, that the youth might be able to, to push forward that antinomian uh, trend to, to, to the place where we would like the world to be? That's a really good question. I, I mean, of late, um, I've been I've been doing a lot of reading uh, the last week or so about QAnon um, and the phenomenon itself, which I find actually fascinating for a variety of reasons. As a scholar of religion, I find it fascinating. I think that 
and this might sound somewhat banal maybe, but I think that part of it is, part of what we're going through was really generated by the consequences of the explosion of communication Hmm. through the internet and social media. And I think 50 years from now, people are gonna look back and say, this was a pivotal moment. I mean, I don't know where we're gonna end up going. This is a pivotal moment. That's probably equal to the moment of the emergence of print. Sure. where somehow the entire way in which people are being able to absorb ideas and be able being able to 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 absorb and 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 then critically assess ideas is radically changing mm-hmm. and i'm not sure we really know what to do i just read this great piece by a certain guy named it wasn't such a great piece it was an interesting piece about <laughs> michael Lin, by Lin, about uh about um what were the implications of, of, of shutting down the president's Twitter feed and then kicking 7,000 people off of instant, right? The, 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 the power of corporations to be able to now determine who gets to speak and what gets spoken as opposed to the, uh, the, the go- a government. I think that, that, I, I think that, I think that that's something that we're really going to have to confront. And I think scholars of religion are really interested in that too, because obviously religion is always going to be interested in about uh, interested in communication and the dissemination of knowledge and notions of authority and notions of control and all of those things, which are always central to kind of any religion are now being played out in are now being played out in our kind of media media wars. You know, talk about the 60s was really about cultural war, right? The 2020s is really about a, is about a media mm-hmm. war. And it, it's not so different, frankly. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's potentially very dangerous, but it, it also has the potential to, to kind of m- perhaps move us forward, hopefully yeah. move us forward. I mean, yeah. I'm not really that much of an optimist, <laughs> but I'm sounding more of an, like an optimist. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm basically a minimalist okay. in that I somehow and, and you know and my wife is always kind of pushing me in this. I basically think that what is ever happening, things are pretty much going to stay the same. Hmm. And and uh, interestingly, I'm always you know being that just by inclination, I'm always attracted to these more apocalyptic like thinkers. Mm-hmm. So maybe it's me kind of just playing out some kind of Freudian fantasy. What. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that brings us to, to a very apropos conclusion of, of this conversation. Me bringing my own cultural background, which is the, the Chabad influence, where the rabbi very much taught that we take any technology and any innovation at our disposal to, to glorify unity and peace and all the things that stand as values of, of the divine in, in our lives. And I hope that we here at the project are, are, are able to do that in a bit and to take to take academics and take scholars like yourself and bring them from behind the, the ivory towers and behind the paywalls and bring their wisdom and bring their learning to the public. And it's definitely, it's definitely a new age and, and a new way that information is moved. And the, there are dangers definitely in that, but there are also beautiful things happening, myself and, and my colleagues here that are trying to bring a peaceful and positive and unif- unitive message. So on behalf of the new mediums that exist on behalf of the new generations that are <laughs> at peril to those new mediums, I'd like to thank you Shal, for joining us here and for sharing your experience and your wisdom. And thank you for making the time out of a busy schedule. And we thank hope you. to continue to see the incredible work that you produce. And we hope in turn to, to give you nachas as well from the work that we continue to, to produce. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I, just, I just want to say that, that, that it is true that a, a lot of the kind of the dangerous media stuff we're seeing now really is is, is supplemented by really the kinds of incredible things that what you're doing and what so many other people are doing. I mean, the way in which people can communicate now and people have access to knowledge and access to beauty is it, it's really phenomenal. So yes, it's really, you're, you're, you're really fighting the resistance. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Shel. And um, thank you for coming on. What's up? I really, I'm... really appreciate it. It's really a lot of fun. Likewise. Thank you so much, Shel. Okay. Let's stay in touch. Please. Okay, Zaitsen. Right.